All right, well, it's good to be with you today. I appreciate the uh, five minutes I get to share with you. And I have to tell you, as Jim mentioned, I've been involved with open source for many, many years, as you can tell from the gray hair. But this has got to be one of the most exciting times that I've ever seen, and I'm, I'm truly excited. And it's because, as Jim mentioned, open source is just exploding. It's catching on. And there's all of these great ideas and great technologies that uh, are going to be talked about this week, a lot of them, right? But they're very, very exciting. Artificial intelligence, digital currencies, distributed signatures, you know, uh, IoT, everything is a service, cloud, right? We can talk about the list can go on and on and on. It seems like this huge spiral. And sometimes it can seem a bit confusing about what in the heck is going on? Is there any commonality to all this? Or is it just this disparate list of, of ideas and projects that everybody seems to be working on? And so I thought about and I thought, so where are we going, right? Is there any kind of direction that you can put to most of these? Now, there's a few squirrels out there that you have to scratch your head and wonder what the heck they're doing. But generally, I've come up with the idea that really what we're doing is empowering humans with technology for any place and any time, okay? Maybe that's a little, sounds a little dumb, but if you think about it, it's pretty, pretty astute. So let me give you an example, okay? Think about your automobile. An automobile is pretty basic, right? You've got brakes to stop, you've got an accelerator to get going, and you've got a steering wheel to give you some direction. Automobiles have been around for a long, long time. Yet the latest car I purchased, the, the owner's manual is probably three times as thick as the last one I bought. And why is that, right? The previous car I bought had all kinds of sensors that would beep at me and tell me that I'm going too fast or I'm swaying out of my lane. Nowadays, with the latest purchase, the car doesn't just beep at me, it actually corrects for me and takes over and tells me that I'm being stupid and that it can be, do a better job, right? So we're enabling humans with technology. And in some cases, we're enabling with such technology that they can actually do a better job than we can. So it's quite fun. But at the same time, as consumers, our expectations are changing. Okay, so Jim mentioned Equifax, and I don't want to pick on them, but I do want to use them as an example, because there's two places where they're going to take a huge hit. We've seen one of them already, right? Um, they came out and they announced, okay, we've lost all this data that I don't understand why they have control of it in the first place. So they took a hit, and you, you saw that in their stock price and the whole bit. But they're also taking a second hit, and, and um, Jim showed the thing, right? So I got on that list. My expectation was, okay, I'm going to go check. As soon as they announced it, I went out to check to see if I was one of those 150 million or 180 million or whatever the number is now to see if I was on the list, okay? So what did I get? I got a response that says, uh, yeah, you're probably on the list. Come back and talk to us next Tuesday about signing you up for identity security. Next Tuesday, right? That's a hacker's eternity. I'm already getting phone calls from people wanting to talk to me about my credit history, right? So that's an eternity. As a consumer, our expectations are much different than years ago. Used to be, you know, you'd, you go to your financial institution, you deposit uh, money into the account, and our expectation was is we'd be able to use it, you know, a week later. Our expectations today are much different than they used to be years ago. We demand instant services. We demand instant solutions. We want them on demand, right? When Equifax happened, I didn't wait till I got home. Right? I was traveling, I turned around and said, I gotta go figure this out now. So I want that mobile access, I want it securely, and I want it reliably, no matter wherever I'm at. Well, so if we look at that from a consumer perspective, that's putting huge demand and pressure on the businesses that are providing those services to us. And if you look at those businesses, that's turning around putting pressure on the people that are developing those services those service providers or underlying infrastructure with the IT. 
So businesses have to dedicate themselves and differentiate themselves with speed. Time to market, fast response. They've got to be very agile, and they've got to lead their competition. So the next question you have to ask is, OK, if it's pressure on the business, that's pushing pressure back onto those service providers and onto the IT. What's on their minds? What are they thinking about? Well, it turns out they're in this huge transformation, all the way from their infrastructure itself to the types of applications they're deploying to the very architecture of those applications and even their development process. Huge change, huge motivation to change, right? Survivability. Well, I have just a couple seconds left, but I wanted to throw this slide in for two reasons. One, SUSE, which I've been a part of for many years, is empowering this transformation. And I had to throw this on here because I think SUSE has one of the most fun uh, mascots of any, any business in the industry. I'll bet at least half of you have picked up one of these over the years to at least give to your kids, right? And what I didn't, wasn't able to bring because of the size of my luggage, our expectations have changed. We've all picked up one of these, and if you haven't, go down and see them in the booth and pick one up. But our expectations are changing because now we have big ones, right? And we're all coveting to get the big ones. But even Suse's uh, developed this power to help you transform. And I'm throwing up an eye chart here. And typically, we talk about all the latest and greatest technologies, all the, what I call the, the flashy stuff, right? The containers as a service, and the Kubernetes, and platform as a service, and, and all the cloud stuff. But I actually didn't want to do that today. I just wanted to take 30 seconds to talk about something we actually don't talk about as much. Uh, and that's based off two events that happened this week. I want to talk lower down in the stack. I actually want to talk about the operating system. So there's two events that happened uh, within this last week. First is uh, an anniversary of SUSE. They've been in business for 25 years. And as the uh, first company to deliver enterprise SUSE to, to the enterprise environment, that means we've been doing open source for a long time. A lot of times we focus on what I call the flashy stuff, the latest and, and greatest stuff. And, and I've had people say, oh, any open source project that's over five years old is yesterday's news, right? Well, if that's the case, then what does that make for Linux? So the second, which brings me to the, the uh, second event that, that happened last week, and that is that SUSE uh, released their, their latest version of their enterprise operating system. And you would think after 25 years, there really wouldn't be any news at that level, right? 25 years, old project. But yet, just the opposite. Let me just give you a couple highlights here in the last 30 seconds to, uh, to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So you would think after 25 years, the amount of choice would go down. It's actually going up, right? So for example, SUSE's uh, one, of, one of their partnerships that they've had probably almost from the beginning is with IBM with the mainframe, right? So we still have uh, SLES on, on the mainframe. They added uh, functionality with this latest release to optimize workloads, providing full support for KBM on Z series, okay? Intel. Uh, improve the, uh, the infrastructure agility with Intel, supporting their latest and most innovative Xeon series uh, processors. That's being used to advance um, data analytics and artificial intelligence. Also with AMD, added support for their latest series of Epic and Ryzen processors. Of course, we've got ARM, support for ARM, right? ARM's being used because of their ability for high compute density and low power consumption, which is driving um, a lot of support in the area of high performance computing. Then, of course, we've got the, uh, the power systems, um, which gives us high performance for uh, data analytics and transformation with their uh, Power9 processors. And we see a lot of this being used, particularly in the SAP HANA uh, environment for uh, 
um, extended virtual address space because of the extended virtual address space. Think of the different variety of, of processors and hardware that are out there that's being used. Again, uh, with this release, adding in support for uh, MVM Express, right, for um, faster remote storage and so forth. So new features, a project 25 years old, new features, new functionality, providing us more and greater support, more and greater opportunity and choice. So just because a project has some age doesn't mean that it's not important and that it's not uh, providing us the choice that, that we're looking for. So this is why I'm, I'm excited about uh, the opportunities that we have today with open source. Because this technology, not just the latest and greatest and shiniest, but all these projects that we've been working on for years are providing us the technologies and features that are enabling us as humans um, to innovate and to uh, realize a potential that was not possible even a few years ago. And for that, I thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Kim. Thank you so much.